coming up in today's episode. He was high on reality testing, but low on optimism. Well, that's a recipe for disaster in sales, right? You see all the obstacles in front of you. Welcome to episode 88 of Enter the Mind podcast, the most real talk, no nonsense podcast on the empowering of the mind. Today's guest is Merit Khan, CEO of Select Sales Development. She's here to talk about the psychology of sales. So Merit, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. So let's start off with, uh, could you just say a little bit about how you originally got into the field of sales? I think it's like any uh, family. Some families are doctors. There's families that have lots of lawyers in them. Uh, I came from a family of salespeople. So I grew up, it was really never a question of what was Merritt going to do with her life. It was more of a question of what's Merritt going to sell? I don't know. <laughs> so I started in radio advertising and uh, became a sales manager pretty young in my career, if I'm honest about it. And then I got into the field of uh, training, coaching, developing people as as part of my management role. I was helping grow people and I realized that those were the parts of the business that I really liked. So I organized my whole business around those services as opposed to the advertising things that I was doing, but it was always sales, always. Got it. And you talk about three areas, I believe, mindset, mechanics, and motion. Is that correct? Yeah. So our company, Select Sales Development, our philosophy is really, while we teach you how to sell, we actually want you to stop selling. When you think about sales, you think about pushy, aggressive salespeople, right? We don't want people to do that. We're not training you to go out there and go, you know, third copy is yours, press hard, is Tuesday or Thursday better? Like all that old school sales stuff. That's not us. We want people to be selected. And that's why we call our company Select Sales Development. But we spell it S-E-L-L-E-C-T, uh, which is maybe terrible for finding us on the internet. <laughs> but it's it makes sense for our philosophy. Stop selling. Start getting selected. Yeah, I can see that because w- when I'm dealing with an effective salesperson, I don't feel like I'm being sold to. Yes, exactly. It sounds like you train salespeople, right? So what's the number one thing that that they need to learn, especially at the beginning, in order to get into this right mindset? If you're in sales more than 10 minutes, you're going to face some rejection, right? Like Not everybody's going to say yes to your offers. And so you have to get back in the game. And a lot of people take a long time to sort of recover from rejection, And by focusing on mindset and what you can do deliberately, it really shortens that process and gets you back out there so that you can make more sales, right? That's one of the things that's super important when it comes to mindset. But I've always, I think really the key, the secret is that the first step to a closed deal is always an open mind. And the sooner you can open your own mind that there's a possibility that you could do more business than you are, then that sets something in motion in terms of how you interact out there in a sales capacity. But when you open the mind of your prospect to even hearing your offers, to considering a conversation with you, you need that before Anything that I would teach you in how to get to budget, how to get to the decision maker, how to shorten your sales cycle, how to hold your rate, like none of that matters if you're not talking to somebody with an open mind. So I wanted to know about emotional intelligence. When did emotional intelligence come into your business? Yeah, it was it was fairly early in my business. It came about, I, I remember I had these two guys in my training class and they worked for the same company. They sold the same products and services in the same territory at the same price point. They started at the same time. I thought they even looked a little bit alike. I mean, it was just like same, same, same. So they were a great case study. I didn't really think about it like that at the time, but it turned out that they were because Stephen would take everything that he learned in class and he just ran with it. And he had great sales numbers. He was, he was improving like I was excited, right? I was like, Ooh, look at me. I'm a good trainer. You know, look at me as a coach. Like he's making it happen. And then Daniel sat right next to him and 
I was like, wait, why isn't Daniel getting the same results? I had to look at it and say, what is the difference here? Because I can't take credit for Stephen's success if I'm not also taking responsibility for the fact that Daniel has not done anything and he sat right next to the guy having success. So what's the difference? Because it's clearly not me. It's not my my content. You know, what am I missing? And I I stumbled on emotional intelligence, frankly. And at that time, it wasn't as popular as it is today. I had to explain it. Nobody understood it. But when I looked at their reports, it was super clear. Like Stephen had high self-regard. He was assertive. He had empathy for others, but he wasn't afraid to say, this is the solution I have. Are you open to it? You know, whatever he said. Daniel was lower in, in those things. He didn't have an optimistic outlook. He was high on reality testing, but low on optimism. Well, that's a recipe for disaster in, in sales, right? You see all the obstacles in front of you, but if you don't see it working out as a possibility, then all those obstacles are going to block you from being in action. So how did things end up for uh, Daniel? Did he ever develop these sales skills? Great question. I wish more people asked me that one because Daniel did have a turnaround. You know, was not overnight. So I'll I'll start with that. Like let's be let's not be in an argument with reality. Um, but we <laughs> built a plan. We looked at of the fifteen attributes that we could assess in terms of his um, emotional intelligence, and then looked at how we layered the mechanics of selling on top of those that foundation. We were able to zero in on, um, now I have to think back, I believe we zeroed in on assertiveness and self-regard for him. And once we kind of worked on those aspects, we could see a shift happening and he started to use more of the training that he was that he had learned and it started to make a difference. You started to see that Daniel's experience was mirroring more closely the results that Stephen naturally got because he started with a stronger foundation. And that's, I think, a, just a really important piece of the puzzle. They almost sound like personality traits, but as you're describing them, it sounds like those are like the measures that make up the emotional intelligence score. Is that how it's how it works? Yeah. So we call them attributes, right? So there's 15 attributes that comprise emotional intelligence. I will say it is distinct from a personality assessment or a behavioral style assessment, like you might be familiar with a DISC profile. In a behavioral style assessment, there is a natural way of being. And it's very difficult to become something else completely. With emotional intelligence, though, nothing is fixed. Everything, it's situational. Your report could look different if you take it under a stressful situation. I assessed somebody recently assessing an entire leadership team for a large uh, nationwide multi-million dollar organization. I assessed 55 of their top leaders. And each one of them got a one-on-one -on -one debrief with me to go through their report. But this one guy, the report was a complete outlier. And I thought, wow, I have assessed a ton of people in this organization. And everybody is super high in these particular attributes, except this guy. What's going on here? And so... I always start from a place of curiosity, and before I share any results, I say, tell me a little bit about what's already on your radar screen, what are you already working on, what have you been told in the past that you know are your strong suits or your improvement areas, and he said, well, you know, I just started here, like, within three months, and so I'm just kind of figuring things out here, but... You know, in my old role, I was there for 15 years and da, da, da. And I was like, oh, well, that makes sense. No wonder you're low here. But, you know, it was like self-regard was low and assertiveness was low and independence was low. I'm like, how did this guy get a management role? But it made sense when I understood the context of his situation. When you are in a new position, you have a lot to learn. And so you kind of naturally gravitate down a little bit in certain categories, but that's situational. What are some strategies for improving one's emotional intelligence? Well, I think the most important thing is to recognize that it's not the individual attributes that are important in and of themselves. 
It's the way that those attributes play together in combinations. So I'll give you an example. At the beginning of the pandemic, and I know we don't want to belabor that point, we're all over it. But if you think about like March, April, May, even June, there was so much uncertainty, so much drama, and a lot of salespeople didn't even know like how to how to have conversations. Like that was the number one thing I was getting asked. Like, can I make sales calls right now? Like it doesn't feel appropriate. Like I'm not even sure what to say. So I did some research. I really was very observant of, of my clients and and I knew their emotional intelligence profiles. And here's what I noticed. There were people that had high empathy and low assertiveness. And when they made calls, it was, hey, I just wanted to check in. How are you doing? Is everything okay? If there's anything I can do, please let me know, right? Now, these were people that had solutions to problems that were relevant, pandemic or not. But their high empathy, low assertiveness led the way, didn't matter how good the mechanics of selling, knew, knowing what to say, it didn't matter because that took over. Then I had some people that were high assertiveness, low empathy, and they just made the same old calls that they were making before. And it was like, hey, I've got this thing. You need to know about it, right? Like they were pushy and aggressive, and I've been working on them to not do that. Um, so <laughs> You know, that guy's just, you know, a jerk. You don't want to do business with him. So really what we focus on is bringing things in balance, right? So when your empathy and assertiveness, as an example, is in balance, those calls sounded like, hey, I know that, you know, it's tough out there. First, I wanted to check in. Are you okay? Is your family okay? Like anything I can do on that front. If you're open to it, in the face of all the things that we can't control right now, would you be open to having a conversation about the one thing that we really could take control of and help you with? The solution that we have that could fix this one little challenge that you've got. And that's a great example of empathy and assertiveness in balance. That's what you want. Maybe a common customer complaint of certain salespeople would be that the salesperson is too unidimensional like they're they're just only assertive. The other one, just only empathic. I rarely see a report where there's like one outlier of strength and everything else is is low or random. You know, things are there's generally some patterns that you notice. First of all, you can learn your wiring. You can do an assessment, you can do a debrief. There's you could buy a an assessment from Barnes and Noble off the shelf for $5. I just, and self score it. it. It's better than nothing. It's just, my coaching to you would be find somebody who uses a scientifically validated tool. We're talking about how you process everything. It's not just a business tool. It's Everything in life gets filtered through the emotional intelligence wiring that you have. Not everybody needs my sales training and coaching. Not everybody needs to hire me as a keynote speaker. But oh my gosh, if you did one thing, do the emotional intelligence report and debrief it with a trained professional coach. Doesn't have to be me, but find somebody who really understands this body of work. It impacts literally everything in your life. And once you see it, your scores on paper and you have this awareness, then you can make some deliberate choices. You can select what to work on or what not to. You can understand the patterns and you're much more in control. You may look at your scores and say, Yep, that is how I am, and I'm doing nothing about that. You might like how you're wired, so let's not always make it, let's not awfulize it. I know about me, I'm very high optimism, and I am I was, when I first took the assessment, very low in reality testing. That meant no matter what you said to me, like in sales, that's a terrible recipe, by the way, because it meant like if you said, oh, Merit, I'm, I'm interested in what you said, like this was a great conversation. I spent my commission that I hadn't earned yet um, on my way home from from that sales call. Like, I was like, oh, well, they said they liked it, so of course they're going to buy it. No, that's not what they said. And it had me step over some potential issues or obstacles or concerns that that prospect had. And so it was really important. Once I saw high optimism, low reality testing on my own report back in, you know, 15 years ago, I was able to go, oh, I see how that affects me in my business. And here's 
how I want to handle that. I need to be able to say to somebody, I appreciate that you're interested and you like what we've been talking about. I just want to make sure I'm not going to leave here thinking optimistic thoughts, but I didn't ask you any challenges, obstacles, like what would happen if we weren't going to move forward with this? Like if you had one concern, what would it be? I'd rather draw that out up front than have them think about that when I've already left. So seeing that dynamic on paper helped me make some different decisions about how I operated in my conversations and that totally transformed my results. From all of your experience in life, why is it that you think that people have just liked to buy from you? Is it because you act with integrity? Is it because you have a win-win mindset? Is it, you know, why do you think that they've mostly bought from you? Yeah, I don't have any of those things. Okay. So <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> oh yeah, I don't know why. Uh, I thought about yeah, integrity. It. Oh, should I have integrity? Darn. Um, <laughs> no, I think my my gift is. I see possibilities everywhere. And so very early on, I learned how to bring the defense wall down so that people were open to having straightforward conversations with me without trying to posture. I work a lot with business owners, entrepreneurs, people leading sales teams. Their things aren't perfect yet. There's more potential. And so sometimes there's this concern, like I'll judge them for, you know, they should have been further along than they are or whatever. And so I think I learned very quickly how to make people feel at ease and just have a straightforward, open conversation with me. So that's the first piece. But then the question that I've I've always asked, I do this in my keynotes, large conferences, I have people asking themselves, have you already decided it can't get any better? Or are you open to a new possibility? And I think that's, well, first of all, it's a magic question. And I ask myself first and foremost, I look at an area of my business, a relationship, an attribute that I'm personally working on. It doesn't matter. I can apply that question to anything that isn't perfect yet, anything that I'm looking to grow. And I can say, have I already decided it can't get any better? Or am I open to a new possibility? And when I ask myself that question, it forces me to go, no, I'm not satisfied with that yet. There is a new possibility. Now it opens up, okay, what am I going to do about that? How am I going to think about that? What do I need to shift in my mindset, the mechanics, or how I'm in motion? So that's the first piece. But then I ask other people that question, and it opens up a new possibility for them. And I think that's, you know, of all the training and consulting and all the things that I've learned as a participant and that I do with my clients, I think the, the biggest gift that I give them and myself is that opportunity to step into a new possibility with an open mind. Awesome. So Merit, if people want to learn more about your materials, your process, your company, what's the best way for them to do that? Go to MeritCon.com. It's M-E-R-I-T-K-A-H-N.com. Put a forward slash podcast on the end of that. And there'll be some resources that you can download. You can do a, an assessment online for free, not the emotional intelligence one, but a different one. And yeah, that's a, there's always a let's talk button on my, on my site. So if anything that I said intrigued you at all, just click that button, grab some time on my calendar, and let's actually have a conversation. Imagine that. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Could I just say oh, one more thing? Of yeah, go for it. Yes, of course. So, Merritt, you're a comedian. I am. <laughs> and you are the producer, writer of a one-woman comedy show? Yes. Very cool. Um, I had to bring that up because I, I love that you're so versatile. It's a lot about what I believe in. You know, you can be whoever you want. You can do whatever you want. You don't have to stick to one field. So I love that you're a comedian. Um, does that help in... Because I feel like funny people, like funny people just have like a way of communicating with people. It's like, can turn anything into a connected, fun joke. That's exactly why I started studying stand-up comedy back in 2014. Shut up. And 
uh, because I noticed how I felt when I was in an audience and, you know, a comedian could take a, a controversial topic or a difficult subject and because they were bringing light and humor to it, it relaxes everybody. And I thought if I could learn how to do that for my business, then it, it just added another layer of, of helping people open up to me so that we could address their real issues and help them grow their companies or their sales or whatever it is. So it definitely helped me in business. It's definitely made my keynote programs a lot more fun for my audiences and for me. But writing the one woman show, I, I do plan to take that on tour at the end of 2022. We'll kick it off in Denver in November. It's an inspiring comedy show. You'll leave going, well, that was interesting. That's the story of, it's the story of my life as told through a lens of comedy. So I look at all the ups and downs of life. We all have them. And really, yeah, you, you see, it's, it's the journey back to who <laughs> I've always been. And I think that's everybody's story. Oh God, I love comedy. I'm, I'm just, I'm already laughing as you can see. Um, <laughs> that's great. Well, congratulations for that. You know, I hope that it goes well and everybody who is meant to be there is there. Thank you so much for coming on, Merit. It's been a pleasure having you. Well, thanks you guys. I enjoyed it. And you've uh, convinced me or you've in influenced me to be a loyal listener. I love all the episodes that I was listening previously. And um, I think you do a great show. Did you find at least one gold nugget in today's episode? Then please like and subscribe and share it with a friend. And finally, if you're looking for a community of like-minded people, join our free Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash enter the mind.